Texas Lutheran University. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's so great to see all of you here, TLU colleagues and colleagues from many other institutions. Uh, this is our third annual Engaging Pedagogy Conference. And this year's conference represents growth for us with a record high number of attendees, right at around 170, and more institutions represented, 26, than we've ever had before. Um, I will again note that it's best to take Chris Bollinger at his word when he looks you in the eye, as he did me four years ago, and he said, we're going to have a teaching conference, and it's going to get bigger and better every year, and it's going to become a regional presence. And I think without any doubt, we can see this year that we are well on that road. Um, of many examples that I can point to when the best thing that an administrator can do is simply to get out of the way and let the faculty do what they do best, I would say that this conference and the Center for Teaching and Learning in general at TLU is a great example of that. And I would like to recognize not only Chris, but the members of the Center, in, Center for Teaching and Learning Committee here at TLU. I want them each to stand, and I want us to give them a round of applause. They include Lisa Craddit, Donna Kubina, Martha Wren, John Sieben, and of course, Chris. So you all stand, please. Your work and your leadership is incredibly important and we would not be doing what we're doing today without you, so thank you. I believe that all of us in this room probably have at least three things in common this morning. First of all, we are somewhat tired at the end of the semester. Secondly, we are passionate about teaching. And third, we believe that we can learn from one another by sharing our experiences in the classroom. Given the day that is ahead of us and the schedule that we have to choose from, I am pretty certain that the passion and the sharing are going to carry us through our tiredness and that the sessions that we're going to enjoy today will re-energize all of us for the most important work that we do on our campuses. So I again wanna say a thank you for being part of this day, whether you're presenting, whether you're here just to listen and learn, whether you're someone who's here every day or whether you're a visitor to our campus. I thank each of you um, for being here, and I thank you most especially for your commitment to teaching excellence. And I'm pleased now to turn things over to John Sieben. Well, let me add my welcome. I'm glad everybody is here. We're honored today to have as a keynote speaker Dr. Annalise Hedinger. Dr. Hedinger is a thoroughly qualified academician having earned a BS degree from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, an MS degree from the University of California, Northridge, and a PhD degree from the University of California, Davis, all of those in marine biology, ecology fields. She knows the marine environment. Her first scuba certification, open water dives, were conducted at Peggy's Cove just outside of Halifax, Nova Scotia, on New Year's Day in a wetsuit instead of a dry suit. She has done research at the Wrigley Labs on Catalina Island, where she daily went diving in the kelp with the occasional great white shark to check the instruments that she had deployed there. While at UC Northridge, she also participated in a National Science Foundation Young Scholars Program at McMurdo Sound, Antarctica. While on that southern continent, she did research. She ran a half marathon on the ice. She visited with David Attenborough, and she peeked inside every pub on the sound. <laughs> and in fairness, there were only four. <laughs> but good work, Annalise. She studied oysters at Bodega Bay, California. That's part of the UC Davis Marine Laboratory System. And just south of there, at Tomales Bay, she taught me the joy of oysters on the half shell warmed over a charcoal fire 
and dipped in a red sauce with horseradish. Dr. Hedinger has taught an amazing breadth of circumstances and students from elementary school kids to graduate students. It was my pleasure a few years ago to set as a mouse in the corner in a classroom at the Marine Research Station at Coos Bay, Oregon, and to watch and listen to her interacting with her summer students. She was outstanding, and that should be no surprise, but it was a joy to see her displaying the depth of knowledge and understanding of these students as she, and the patients as she worked with them. And others besides me have noted her depth of knowledge and her outstanding ability to communicate complicated science issues. Two years ago, she was called upon to testify before the U.S. Congressional Shellfish Caucus concerning the effects of ocean acidification on the shellfish industry. Most recently, her passion has turned to science writing and communication and the importance of science being at the table as we formulate public policy. Not surprisingly, she excels at communication and she is able to communicate the implication of scientific discovery and she already has a list of presentations and publications that dwarfs my lifetime list. I'm a little bit jealous. Besides professional activities, this woman kayaks, backpacks, cycles, scuba dives, and is an exemplary mother to my grandchildren. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Annalise Hedinger. Well, thank you very much for that incredible <laughs> introduction. Um, and thank you very much for having me today. I'm really honored to be here. Um, it's, it's special for a lot of reasons. Uh, my, my mother taught here for more than 30 years, and it's, it's a little surreal um, to, to now be a, a keynote speaker at the, the regional um, pedagogy conference. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk today um, a little bit about my experience as, as a scientist and as a woman um, and um, tell you some personal stories about some of the, the joys and struggles um, in my journey and some of the ways that I'm um, trying to, to help other, other women um, in, in scientific fields. So I'm a scientist turned scientist communicator is sort of how I like to describe myself. Um, and as John said, I have a PhD in ecology and a master's in biology. Um, how many people can recognize the organism shown on the screen here on the far, far left? Your far left. Anybody want to venture a guess at what those are? You're not allowed to answer. <laughs> They do live in the plankton, so they're, they're up in the, in the water column. What kind, of, what kind of organism do you think it might be? It's a baby, if that helps. Give you another hint. Anybody? There is a hint that, that John gave in, in an organism that I've studied. It's an oyster, yeah. <laughs> it's a baby oyster. Um, and you can sort of imagine, you can kind of see the shape of that shell and how you know, it might look as it grows into an adult. Um, but I've spent a lot of time staring through microscopes looking at, at baby oysters. Um, the other picture in the middle here is of Tamales Bay, just north of San Francisco, where I've spent a lot of time um, with oysters. Um, and then more recently, I've started working on um, coral and algae, which if you've, if you've spent much time out on the shore, um, where the land and the sea meet, um, you've seen these, these pink crusting species, and they, they are algae, um, but that have calcium carbonate in their body. So the same thing that makes up oyster and mussel shells um, is in the tissue of the algae. Um, and they're a really important species for a lot of reasons. So just, just kind of fun for me to show some of the, the species that I spend, spend time with. 
So how did I get here? Why am I a scientist? You know, a lot of times scientists don't talk about why they're willing to spend so much time toiling away in laboratories or at field sites, you know, by themselves, um, collecting data. Um, for me, it really stems from the, the type of childhood that, that I had. So I grew up spending my summers um, on a really tiny island in Georgian Bay, um, which is part of the Great Lakes system um, up in Ontario, Canada. Um, my, my family and I were the only people on, on the island and we didn't have electricity. Um, so my, my brothers and I had to get really creative in the out of doors. Um, that's a picture of me you know, having collected these freshwater mussels and we would scrape them on the rocks until they'd get shiny. Um, we, I played with a lot of sticks growing up, um, but I really grew up immersed in this world of discovery and I, I very quickly developed a, a deep appreciation for nature. Um, so that was sort of my, my initial connection to, to my natural world. My affinity for biology I like to think of as being passed down from my, from my mom, so both literally and, and figuratively. Um, I sort of grew up feeling like biology was in my blood. Um, as I said, she was um, a faculty member here for um, more than 30 years, and she, you know, she really inspired a whole generation of students. Um, and she, she certainly inspired me, um, and I've sort of been following in her footsteps in some ways. Um, so I, I did enroll um, as a biology major actually in a small liberal arts university um, just north of Austin, um, Southwestern University. Um, and I took an animal behavior class from Dr. Jesse Purdy um, that really was a game changer for me. So um, Dr. Purdy opened my eyes to the world of animal learning research um, using cuttlefish. So he had a laboratory there at Southwestern full of cuttlefish. Um, I, how many people have seen a cuttlefish before? They're, I mean, they're these incredible organisms. Um, and we would also, every Monday, we would watch a film um, by Sir David Attenborough, because he, you know, he has all the animal behavior. How many people have seen a David Attenborough film? If you haven't, I, I really recommend it, um, even if it's just for his uh, wonderful accent and, and, and mode of speaking. Um, but, but those experiences in Dr. Purdy's class led me to have this really strong interest in marine science. And I, I went to Dr. Purdy and I told him that. And he said, well, I can give you an, an excellent education in science and in biology here. Um, but if you want to take specific marine science classes, maybe you could go up to Dalhousie University, where I have some colleagues who also work on cuttlefish. Um, and you could take some marine biology classes for a semester, and then you can come back down, but that way you'll have you know, some specific marine science classes under your belt. He was a good mentor to me. So um, I took that idea to my parents, and uh, maybe they were used to these sort of ideas coming from me. Um, but uh, uh, my mom said, okay, uh, you're going to move up to Nova Scotia in January. I'm, I'm sending your dad with you. You're not going up there by yourself. He's going to try to make sure you have some wool sweaters or something. I mean, I'd, not, I'd never even seen snowfall. You know, I was a 20-year-old college student. I, I thought snow fell in balls. I'm serious, <laughs> like in the cartoons. I'd never seen a snowflake. I mean, I really hadn't. We didn't take winter vacations to snowy places. I mean, it's just, I, you know. So, you know, that was my journey from Southwestern um, up to Dalhousie for, for some marine ecology classes. Um, so what I was sort of expecting in the, the little bit of research I did about that area of the world was, you know, these quaint fishing villages, really good seafood chowder, and I knew I'd have these marine science classes. Well, as I said, we arrived in January. Um, <laughs> luckily, they had a Salvation Army. Um, that my dad took me to to get some wool sweaters, um, which I needed because they, they have blizzards there. Fr freezing rain is, is the common uh, uh, weather in, during that time of year. Um, that's my car. That's how it sat um, for much of the year because I, I had no idea how to drive in the snow. I mean, my roommates were like, take, you know, no, we're taking your key. You're not even gonna attempt to have a Texan driving in those kind of conditions. But it was a really amazing opportunity. Um, I got to spend time out on a boat. I, um, again, had good professors who were 
good mentors to me um, and helped me find my way um, through the curriculum and um, provided research opportunities for me. And um, while I was a student there, I took a, a summer study abroad program in tropical marine science, and I spent time down in Acumal, Mexico, um, along the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef. Um, so here's a map. You can't see too well, but um, how, many, have, how many people have been to the Cancun area before? Some folks, you at least can imagine where that is on the map. So I was south of there. And this Mesoamerican Barrier Reef is the second largest barrier reef in the world. What, what's the first? The Great Barrier Reef, right? That's the largest. Um, so I started a project there um, on coral disease because, um, as it turns out, this reef, um, and I don't know if you can see the graphic too well, but it's, it's talking about how degraded this reef is. Um, and it's considerably degraded, and, and one of the one of the sort of metrics we use to look at degradation is to look at the prevalence of coral reef disease. So I started a project there um, with, my, with my professors that ultimately turned into a co-authored publication with, with one of the faculty um, in particular that I was working with down there. And that experience really, um, these are pictures of the coral disease um, and how it can move across a coral and kill it. Um, but it really affirmed my decision to definitely want to become a marine ecologist. And, I, I stayed at Dalhousie until I finished my, my program. So um, that same professor that I worked with down in Akumal um, helped connect me with folks out in California um, and with a professor that I ultimately ended up working with for my master's degree. So you see the theme here of me being very lucky at having professors that cared about me and who wanted to see me excel um, and who were enthusiastic about my interests. Um, that theme is going to continue um, as I, you know, move through the rest of my address. And I know that, um, that that's important to you, too, or, or you wouldn't be here. And it, it makes a big difference. Um, so um, I'm going to just talk really, really briefly about oysters because I love them and I, I take every opportunity I can to, to tell people about them. Um, oysters are a type of bivalve, and bivalves are a, a group within mollusks. So mollusks include, um, you know, tiny, tiny um, microscopic organisms and the giant squid. It's an incredibly diverse um, group of organisms. Bivalves include things like scallops, clam, mussels, oysters, anything with the two, sh with the two shells. Um, so anyone that's ever eaten an oyster, show of hands. I said, nice. That's, I gave a talk out at the Marine Lab in Bodega Bay recently, and I swear more of y'all have enjoyed oysters than those folks. I'm, that's great. Um, or if you've worn pearls, um, or if you've you know, walked along the beach and collected the half shells, you've, you've come in contact with bivalves. Um, they're easily recognized by their two half shells. Um, they can burrow in sediment. They can live on the ocean floor. Um, and they can, some can even move through the water by snapping their shells, so like scallops will swim this way. It's really beautiful. Um, they don't all have shells. Um, so this is another picture of the babies, and that's what they look like in a microscope. So they're really small, kind of like a grain of sand. Um, they have these complex life cycles. So a lot of, a lot of organisms have complex life cycles, um, and marine invertebrates are, are a group that mostly have complex life cycles. So the, the babies will be up out in the water column swimming around like we talked about earlier, and then the adults come back and live, live on the shore. So they, we call it a biphasic life cycle. So one, one phase of the life is in one type of the environment, and the other phase of the life is in another type of the environment. So these, that's why they you know, call them these complex life cycles. Um, bivalves are also really important um, in human history. So I love this picture of a native woman um, that uh, lived on the Oregon coast. Um, her name uh, is Annie DiTallo, um, and she was known as the Rock Oyster Queen. Here's a, this is her gathering oysters in Newport, Oregon in the late 18th or early 19th centuries. Um, she has a sledgehammer and a pry bar, and that was what was used to collect the oysters. And then those would be carried in a basket. So, you know, humans have been, have been relying on bivalves for a very long time. Um, and they're still really important um, economically, but ecologically as well. So this is an infographic from NOAA 
showing aquaculture production in our country. So um, big, big production on our west coast and our east coast, but in the Gulf of Mexico too. So all y'all who have had oysters, maybe you've you know, enjoyed shellfish from, from the Gulf Coast. Um, and the pictured over here are just various ways that bivalves can be grown. So on the bottom there, um, that's a scallop farm in British Columbia. And then up above, that's a bag of, of oysters um, from an oyster farm in California. So really important. Um, there's a lot of threats to oysters, though. And that's really where my research focuses, is looking at how environmental conditions um, affect, affect oysters. And specifically, this one process called ocean acidification that changes the seawater chemistry, how it can affect their shells. So um, babies that are grown in normal conditions here, they have these, you know, this beautiful, nice, round shape to their shell. And then when they're grown in conditions that are suboptimal because the chemistry is different, their shells can be smaller and deformed and a lot weaker. That's, that's what my research really looks at, is, is how these organisms are being affected by, by changes happening in the environment. Um, and uh, I've, I've been able to be successful with my work. I've you know, published papers, and I have really great colleagues. Um, and I've gotten to interact with a lot of, a lot of high school and undergraduate students. Um, and working with those students, I've realized is sort of my favorite part of, of the entire research process, getting to, to see students work through the scientific method. Um, so I have three different undergraduate students pictured here. This is Kirk, and this is Heather, and this is Margot. Um, we worked together um, over a summer out in California. Kirk is now a PhD student at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Heather is a PhD student at that same place. Um, these are some high school students from um, Sonoma County, California that came out to the coast. And it's just, it's incredible to see, see young people be empowered by making their own discoveries in nature. Um, it's, it's an honor to, to be able to be a part of that. Um, and science has been a really thrilling. It's been hard work, but it's taken me to these amazing places I got to meet you know, the, the person that was such an inspiration to me early on um, when I had the opportunity to go down and work in Antarctica. But, and this is sort of where my, my talk takes a little bit of a, a turn, doing this work and being a scientist has been a, a bigger challenge than I anticipated. You know, I knew that, that going on the path of becoming a scientist would be difficult intellectually. I knew I would really be challenged with the things I had to learn, um, you know, and the work that I needed to do. But I didn't anticipate some of the other challenges that have come up along the way and that um, had I been um, in a different situation would have been really big barriers um, to me. I can stand here as a, as a successful and a well-funded postdoctoral scholar and, and tell you that, that it's been a struggle. And it's especially been a struggle over the last five years as I've started having my own family. Um, so this is a, a graphic. I don't know how well you can see it. Um, it. It came out a few years ago. And you know, this is not something that I wanted to see as a postdoc, you know, as an early career scientist wanting to, to make my way um, and you know, ultimately get a faculty position. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, very difficult to get a faculty position, period. Um, but you know, in, in biology is what I'm, what I'm thinking about. Um, this is just a list of articles. You know, if you do a quick search on Google, um, just you know, glut of postdoc researchers, too few university jobs for America's young scientists, the future of the postdoc, recovering from postdoc mistakes, the academy's dirty secret. Um, it's, it's been a difficult time to be a postdoc, and especially as a woman and as a mother. Um, and my, my struggle has come from, from events in my personal life that have coincided with crux moments in my professional life, um, in the final year of my dissertation and in, in my first year as a postdoc. So the last year of my PhD, I lost my mom. Um, I also had my first child, so I was, you know, basically the happiest and the saddest person you know, at the same time. Um, and what got me through that year was my PhD advisor and my um, dissertation committee 
their support never wavered. You know, no matter how many times I needed to fly back to Texas, no matter what time I needed to be away from the laboratory, they, they totally, they got it. They didn't question my work ethic. They were there for me. They edited um, my chapters. They helped me get my papers published. I mean, they, were, they just really stood up and did that. And that's, that's not the case for everybody in my, you know, that has gone through things that I went through, um, unfortunately. I think my story is maybe rare that I had such support from my, from my entire committee. Um, and uh, here's another uh, graphic that you know isn't great. You see the, um, the you know they talk about the leaky pipeline um, and how you know married you know if you're married it's it's bad, but then if you're if you're a mom it's even worse. Um, so the struggles you know have come from these these um, events in my personal life, like I said, that were coincide, coinciding at this time when I'm trying to make it as an early career scientist, right? Publish papers, get grants, um, you know, do well in my teaching. But it's also come from feeling like I don't belong in science as a woman and especially as a mother. Um, so I've put up here some quotes that I've heard um, from, from new mentors, new, or I, I should maybe not call them mentors, new, new advisors um, uh, in the last four to five years. Um, so these, these quotes I pulled from stories told um, in lab meetings where I was present or things you know, said directly to me, like you know, me telling someone, oh, I'm pregnant with my, my second child, and being asked whether or not that was planned. Um, you know, and, and as somebody who was already feeling vulnerable, you know, I maybe would take, I took that remark to mean that you know, I wasn't committed to my career, because you know, here I am having a, having a second baby. Um, you know, being told, well, okay, technically you, you can have 12 weeks off for maternity leave, but that'd be really hard on the project, so I'd rather you not take that much time. You know, that puts me in a, that put me in a really difficult position as somebody who cares about my career, but also, you know, for anyone who, who has kids or has spent time close to people who do, you know, there are reasons that you kind of have to take some time off after having a, a baby. Um, so another one, the only difference between me and you is years. And you know, that, that being said in a way to maybe help motivate, but it also, for me, made me feel like um, you know, a total disregard for what challenges I may have had to face um, as a woman. So that was you know, a man that had said that to me who was in a, in a level higher than, than me um, in my career. And it just you know, makes you feel like everything you've been through, it's like, I don't know, like it's, I guess, you know, not cared about or totally not recognized. And I don't think any of this comes from an from a evil or a bad place, but it, it sends a message that, that, you know, maybe you don't belong or it make, you know, makes you question whether or not you do. So sometimes in the work that I do to try to recruit more women and underrepresented minorities into STEM fields, I worry what kind of environment are we recruiting those people into? You know, there's a lot of work to be done, and, and you know, I'm all about increasing diversity and increasing inclusivity, especially in the STEM fields. But you know, into this environment, you know, we have work to do. It's and I I struggle with that. It's like, you know, maybe we need to work on this system before we try to get more people in it that are just going to face all these kind of barriers. I don't know what the solutions are. Um, but I can stand up here and say that, you know, I'm still here and I'm working, you know, because I work hard and I'm really determined, just like all my peers, um, but also because I have received excellent mentoring, mostly, mostly. Um, but many people aren't that lucky, you know. There's a lot of people that haven't had that. Um, and even, you know, even fewer people who have folks that look like them um, to have as mentors. And so towards the end of my PhD, um, after I had my first baby, um, I started intentionally seeking out women mentors. And that's something that I had never thought twice about before, before becoming a mother. Um, you know, if things were said to me or around me, 
or if I found myself in uncomfortable situations or even unsafe environments. Um, I ignored it all for the good of science and for the good of my career. And to be honest, I never really considered that I had another option. You know, I didn't really think that I had an alternative way of being. I thought, you know, you just live with that and that's how it is. And if you want to do this work, you just have to, you know, deal with it. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's actually, you know, the most productive, productive way to look. And now that I'm further along in my career, I have that much more power and privilege that I can spend to try to change things. You know, as a graduate student or as an undergrad, you may not have, I, I at least didn't feel like I had, you know, the vulnerability to spare, but now that I'm a little bit further along, I feel that I do, and that feels really good. Um, Labs can be really misogynistic spaces, and you know, like I said, I really ignored that. Um, and you know, the culture isn't going to change overnight. But I think that one way that I can I can be an agent of change is to get really involved in these women in science groups, um, and I can help you know give women other women tools to to deal with with that culture. Um, so, you know, this can be by creating spaces for women to support one another, um, offering direct assistance for any type of sexual harassment, coming up with ideas of how to make campuses safer for women. Um, because really, when, when those things were being said to me after I had, um, after I had my kiddos, so during my postdoc, I, I, I would have welcomed a place to talk about it. And I looked for that, and I didn't find it at my institution. And I, I'm at a big university, you know? Um, and I felt really isolated. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, what's happening? I need somebody to talk to. Um, and so um, what I've done is um, I've, I've gone really hard in, in helping to form this women in science organization at Oregon State University. These are the women pictured above are who I, I lead the organization with. And we do all kinds of different events. Um, so one of the things that we do is we hold these consciousness raising group discussions. We call it Wake Up Coffee. Um, so our first was with Tiffany Garcia, where we just talked about identity. What is identity? What, what are the pieces that make up our identities? Um, then we had our next discussion talking about intersectional feminism and how you know, we're more than just women. We're all these other identities, too. And how do those things intersect? And how does it affect you know, who we are in the workplace and um, how we show up in the workplace, how we can be allies to one another. Um, we had a sociology professor at Oregon State come in and talk about the international student experience at Oregon State um, and how we can be more aware of, of what it might be like to be an international student and how we can better support that community on our campus. Um, and then most recently, we had, we led a discussion about who do you bring to work, you know? We don't always, we are not always able to bring our whole selves to work. So, you know, for me as a mother and a woman in science, a lot of times um, in the past, I would, you know, not highlight that information about myself. I almost wouldn't want to let it be known because I was scared of, you know, what it would make people think about me. You know, but not everybody can, you know, hide their identities in that way, nor is it, you know, a healthy way to, to move around in the world. Um, so we're hoping that by having these discussions, um, we're, you know, creating, uh, raising awareness about, you know, various issues and creating a, a space for people to, people to have important discussions. And the other piece is to, that, that we've brought in through the Women in Science organization is to really think about checking ourselves, looking at our own implicit biases. Um, you know, so these are, these are thoughts and attitudes that operate on a level maybe below our own consciousness. Um, this website has a pretty awesome um, work through that you can look at to examine your own implicit biases. And these aren't, you know, these aren't things to, to say, oh, well, you know, you're, you're bad because you think this way, or you're bad because you think this way. It's just maybe a way for all of us to do a little bit of self-reflection, um, you know, because we all, we all carry these um, as a way to, you know, try to help changing the way that things are. You know, the more we learn about ourselves, maybe, you know, we can engage in, in, um, in more productive ways and then ultimately create institutions and create environments that truly are 
diverse and inclusive. Um, so I think diversity and inclusion matter. I think they're really important. But I think it's how we help each other feel like we belong on the team or we, be or we belong within a community that really matters. So I think a missing piece, a piece that's often missing from that diversity and inclusion conversation is that piece about belonging. And how do you create that in your classroom or in your research lab or in your field site, et cetera, or at your institution? Um, and you know, it's, it's about getting to know one another as people, getting to know our students um, as people with prior knowledge, with history, with, with values, with stories, you know? And, and caring enough, um, and I guess being courageous enough to show a little bit of our own vulnerability and being willing to share some of our own personal stories so that we can, we can make better connections with our colleagues and also with our students. Um, so that we learn from one another, but also so we can help create this, this sense of belonging. Um, I think that storytelling can be a really effective way to, to, help, in, in, to help connect with, with one another that can ultimately lead to a greater sense of belonging and then ultimately, um, you know, hopefully more diverse and inclusive environments. Um, so there was a... Um, a Women in Science Summit um, convened in 2015 at the California Academy of Sciences. It was all recorded and, and broadcast online, and, and the recording is available if you, if you look up um, Women in Science Summit, California Academy of Science. And it was all these incredible women, I mean, hot, amazing women in science, like Jane Goodall, sharing their personal stories about how they became scientists. Um, and, and their joys and struggles. So you can go online. I mean, it's, it's all recorded. So, if, you know, if you or if your students who um, have interest can go on there and read that. And as I was sitting there, I was watching it when I was in Oregon. So I was, you know, in, um, attending it virtually. And I was really feeling these, like, moments of human connection as these stories were being told by the women. Um, and I don't think they're that. I don't think it's that hard to create those moments. Um, I think just like I said, with being willing to to show a little bit of of why you do what you do, um, it can really make a big difference in in our our colleagues, our peers, and our our students' lives. And I think it can have a really positive impact on um, the culture of of an institution um, and on classrooms. So um, it's exciting to think about solutions to, to some of these challenges that, that I faced and that a lot of, of, of other folks um, have faced, not just in the sciences, but I think in, in higher ed in general. Um, and I think having these types of regional conferences is an incredible, incredible way to do that. So it's, I'm, I'm excited and I'm, I'm really impressed by the work that, that all of you guys are doing here. And, and thank you very much for letting me come and tell a little bit about my, myself. If the, yeah. I don't know if there would be. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, hope. Uh, that's. I think it's a great book. She. Oh, she asked about um, what did I think about the book Lab Girl um, by Hope Jaren. J J A R E N. Um, she has an incredible blog. She is very feisty, uh, very accomplished woman in science. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an awesome book. And she is awesome. She's a great writer on top of it. Um, and like I said, I, what got me through um, really the last four years of becoming a mother and still wanting to be a successful academic um, was he hearing other women's stories, you know, that I wasn't um, the only one that was hearing the kind of things I was hearing from my um, my advisor at the time, who's who's I'm not I'm not working with currently, um, but um, I uh, I had a, I I really had a like one year in particular, you know, that I felt 
like I, I mean major imposter syndrome, you know, and this is, you know, several years after I'd earned my PhD and I just felt like, you know, because I had become a mom that there was just no place for me, you know, I was hearing all, I mean, really intense um, and I was really hard struggle. It was a really hard year for me and for my family and Hope's book came out towards the end of that year um, and it, it, it buoyed me. It really did. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Yeah. You were going to ask something. I was just going to say, what's up with that picture of you kissing the grouper? I think you might have photoshopped the grouper in there <laughs> for me. Uh huh. Do you feel, how do you navigate um, whether or not to advise to? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. I think so. Oh, right. Sorry. So she said, "How do I sort of what do I think about, or how would I approach advising my undergraduate students about graduate school and their future, you know, career, given the job market and the job prospects?" Um, that's a very good question, and I think that there's been a lot of rhetoric about this leaky pipeline, and um, more recently, um, a commentary on that came out. It had like 240-something signatories on it. Um, it came out, I think, in Nature. I can get the I can get the um, the link to Chris to put on the website. But it talks about how that is a really horrible metaphor because what it implies is that if you do anything with your degree but go become an academic or go become a PI, then it's less than. When the reality is there are so many things to do with a science master's and or PhD degree. And um, I think that you know we need to change the rhetoric around there. I mean, Yes, there are women leaving science. There are, there's men leaving science too. I mean, it's not just women. Um, but I think what we need to tell our students is, you know, you don't have to, you know, there's a lot of things you can do than become what I, what I am. And I think, you know, naturally, you know, if you're sitting in the position of being a faculty member, that, you know, that's kind of what your students see. And it's like, oh, well, that's what I'm going to go do then. But I think if we can, highlight to our students that there are many other things that they can do, you know, working in agencies, working in consulting firms, doing more science communication, um, working for a conservation organization, um, I mean, on and on and on, that it doesn't mean that it's because they weren't good enough to go become a faculty member at a university. It just means that they wanted to use their skills and their, you know, expertise in a different way. Um, but I don't think that message is, is fully getting out to our students. So I think, you know, it's about talking to our students about what, what do you really want to do? Like, what is it that, that really drives you? If it's asking questions, then by all means, go become a research professor, you know? But if that's not it, then you can choose something else and it's, it's okay. You know, it doesn't mean that you failed. I mean, the message that I've pretty much gotten going through is that if I'm not getting a faculty position at an R1, then it must be because I'm not good enough. But that's ridiculous, and it's not true. Um, and, and that message is, is changing, but very, very, very slowly. So I think you know, it comes down to being better advisors to our students and hearing from them what they're interested in. Because not everybody is going to go be a research professor in R1, and not everybody wants to, and that's, that's good. You know? Do you think of one structural change in the way that people proceed through these structures that would really help as a corrective to some of the difficulties that women in the workplace face? Maybe through tenuring or any, anything that would... Yeah. Um, do you want me to repeat that? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I understand. Um, so I, um, so the question was about 
what would be some structural changes that would help um, maybe decrease the number of barriers to women in the workplace. Um, so I think parental leave policies could be improved, um, not just for women, but for men too, because men are parents just as much as women are, you know? So men should be able to take leave just as well as women. Um, and I mean, there are some things with rank and tenure, like, you know, stopping the clock for a period of time. I know that my, um, one of my um, dissertation committee members did that. Um, she stopped, you know, she, those of you that have served on rank and tenure committees probably understand the ins and outs of that a lot better than I do. Um, and um, childcare, I think, is a big one. I mean, because it's, it's, there's a lot of barriers to women, but there's especially barriers to women who have any kind of caretaking role, whether it be of a, you know, anybody in the family, not just a child. And so, um, but thinking about childcare in particular, um, you know, if there's ways that institutions can somehow help, um, you know, especially when the children are young before they're, they're in school, I mean, that's, it can be prohibitively expensive for people, um, you know, if they don't have family around to help out. Um, so I know that at like Oregon State University, for example, there's a lot of emphasis right now on the leave policies and on how to make childcare not so burdensome for families financially and just finding good childcare. Um, so those are, I think those are all things that institutions can think about that will be more supportive and you know when 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 the institution is more supportive, you're it's you're going to I mean be able to retain a more diverse, you know, people. So what ways would you recommend for a mom to combat the stigma of being a mom to potential employers? So the question was how, how, how might a, a mother combat the, the stigma associated with being a mother? Um, is, that, yes. is that right? Um, I mean, I think there's two approaches, and it's going to be a little bit dependent on an individual's personality. Um, one way is to just show up with your children <laughs> at things you need to be at. Um, you know, whether it be a faculty meeting or, I mean, I've, I've even, I, I uh, attend several conferences a year, and I'll see women like wear their child, their, you know, if it's a really, really young child you know, wear that child even when they're giving a presentation. Um, so in that way, you just kind of own it, <laughs> you know? This is, I have children, I'm not gonna hide them. Um, and then the other way is to, is to, you know, work a little bit more behind the scenes on, on trying to change the culture and then on trying to change the policies that are, that would make it more supportive. So, you know, making sure there's lactation rooms, for example, um, and that it's like nobody's going to blink an eye when you need to take a sh short break to use that lactation room, for example. You know, you're not going to get any eye rolls or sighs when it's like the time where you need to go, where people are saying, where the heck were you? You know, because that makes it hard. And I mean, I, I mean, I went through that in my, my very difficult year as well. <laughs> describe it as. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, changing stigmas take time. And I think that talking about it and talking about our personal experiences and highlighting it, like, I'm saying all this now, I don't think my dad knows that everything I went through. But now he's listening to me talk about it, now he knows. And, you know, I think, I like to think of him as being an example of, of someone that's pretty aware and understanding, but say somebody maybe wasn't, and then heard a personal story, it's like, oh, wow, okay, I'm gonna do better next time, I didn't realize. You know, it's not somebody's fault that they might not realize, but if you never talk about it, you know, how are you gonna make a change? How are you gonna change the stigma? Yeah, it's hard, it's really challenging. And if you have any choice in who you work with, choose your colleagues well. I've, uh, 
I've learned that now. <laughs> yeah, you don't always have a choice, though. You have sometimes, in your talk, presented this as a, uh, a kind of a male versus female um, exchange. But I think uh, a lot of my colleagues that I heard have problems with this are getting more flack from the women yeah. who said, hey, I did it. Yeah. Suck it up. You can do it. Yeah. So um, the, the comment was about, you know, it's not just, um, ch challenges aren't just coming from, from men, it's, it can come just as easily from women. Um, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's been some recent studies that show like, you know, double blind studies where they're looking at how people make decisions about jo uh, job candidates, for example. And, you know, women showing just as much bias against women as a man would. I mean, the, re the research is very clear on that. Um, so, you know, that's a product of our society. Um, and it's true. I mean, you know, the women, women that I've had as mentors that, um, you know, went through all of this 15, 20 some odd years ago, I mean, it was even more difficult. And, uh, and I think there, in fact, I'll just tell a real quick story. I always try to go back to like, okay, is there a story I can tell that will help um, describe my, my experience with this. So we, um, our Women in Science organization, we work a lot with the Women in Policy group and the Women in Marine Science group at Oregon State, and we do a lot of um, events together. We convened a panel about how to, as, because field season is coming up, field season is you know, usually spring and summertime for ecologists, and because field season is coming up, we convened a panel to talk about handling harassment um, in the field, basically. Um, and we, it was, you know, three women that were invited to be on the panel. One of them was um, very early on, she's like a second year faculty member, and the other women were tenured already, so, you know, however long, so. Um, and they were getting questions from the students about how to handle inappropriate comments while like on a cruise, on a, not a cruise ship, like, you're going to Mexico, I mean like an oceanographic cruise where you're gonna go collect data. They, they call those cruises also, different type of cruise. Um, very different type of cruise. Um, but you know, a student who, there's a big oceanographic school at Oregon State, so there's a lot of students, um, you know, men and women who go out on these cruises. And they asked, you know, she said, how do I, how do, what, how do I handle that? So I skipped over that part of my talk, but um, these are, you know, what, what we refer to as microaggressions. So, you know, all those little quotes that I put up, those are, you know, microaggressions that little by little prick away at you, you know, make you feel like you don't belong. So how, you know, how do we handle microaggressions? You know, how, what do I say to, you know, my advisor who's saying this kind of stuff to me? What do I say? You know, in the past I've always ignored it. Is there another response? you know, to try to change the stigma, to try to change things, and not confront people in an aggressive way, but in a, hey, I don't think you meant to say it this way, but this is how it comes across. I just want to let you know. You know, that might be one way to handle a microaggression. But the women who were, fur you know, further along in their career said, ignore it. You just ignore it. R let it roll off your back, you know? That's what they've done, and that's what, I've, that's what I always did. I mean, I have spent you know, many, 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 many months of my life in, in research, in field sites. And I've heard all kinds of stuff to me and to, you know, people, women around me. I've always ignored it. I never, I never even considered a, that I wouldn't ignore it. And that's what these women said to the student who asked the question. The woman who was like a first, she's like a second year faculty, listened to those responses, and then she said, well, I just can't do that. And it got really awkward in the room. I mean, seriously, you could feel the tension like, Ugh. and that faculty member was like, I just can't do that anymore. You know, she, she also had ignored stuff early on, you know, when she was a PhD student. She, this woman is from Panama, and so was working down there um, before coming up to Oregon State. And, uh, Honestly, the students who were asking the questions didn't want to hear to just ignore it. They wanted to hear something different. They wanted to hear an actual tip, a piece of advice on an alternative response. I don't, yeah. 
So that's, sorry, that was a really long answer to your question, but, um, but the point is that it's not, it's not just, you know, women against men. It's women passing down this kind of advice to younger women to just ignore it, which just to me perpetuates something that we need to change. So that was my long way of saying, yes, it's, it's women and men, and it's, yeah, it's challenging. I think we have to be willing to be real with one another and be vulnerable. And I think looking back on what I went through in my very difficult year is, you know, when somebody said, when my, my advisor was like, well, was it planned when I told him that we were having a second baby? Instead of the way I responded, which was to make a joke out of it, I could have laughed and then, you know, maybe later gone into his office and just said, hey, you know, just, I just want to let you know that you know, when you said that earlier, it made me feel like you questioned how seriously I take my career. I know probably you didn't mean that at all. That's just how I perceived it. So again, using those like I statements. And this is how I experienced what you said. And um, I want, you know, maybe I could have said, I want you to know I'm really dedicated to my career, but I'm also dedicated to being a mother. And I can do both of those things. And, you know, maybe there's like some gentle way that, yeah, it's going to be a little bit awkward, but maybe it kind of makes you grow in your relationship with that person in a way if you can just be honest and just, but not in a, you shouldn't have said that, da, 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 but in like, a, this is how I experienced what you said. And I mean, it puts the onus on the, the person who's feeling that way, which, you know, but I don't know, maybe that's a way to help. Yeah. question, I just have a comment about what you're saying about cultural gender change. We need to go, uh, that should be another topic we can mm. experience because, for example, in San Antonio, Lackland Air Force Base has um, suffered a lot of lawsuits because of that particular gender uh, environment where um, the older, I'm going to say the older generation mm makes comments and, and things that are not appropriate. Mm -hmm. And the newer generation is just not going to ignore it. They're going to, um, as, as they're doing now, expose this. Yeah, I don't think the younger generation is going to take it anymore. It's, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I, that's, yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not really aware of all the things happening there, but I can, I can imagine. Um, academia is probably a lot slower to change, maybe, than some other institutions. I'm not, you know, but that's, yeah. But we've come a long way from the madman generation. Yeah. Uh, and when you said women having their child, carrying their child in a, in a conference, that's tremendous because that shows that, I mean, we're part of the environment. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's amazing. Um, I remember all that stuff in the news about the, the Italian representative who had her child with her at like the EU. Do you guys remember that? At the EU meeting? Sorry, I should, I should have like her name and her position, everything on the tip of my tongue. But I remember that being this huge, oh my God, there she is with her kid again. You know, she's voting, her kid's right next to her. You know, and she, you know. <laughs> I remember that. I wasn't, that was just a few years ago. It was a big deal in the news. It was all over the place. I should know her name because it was all over the news. Anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.